end of Romans 3. But now, this side of the cross, not that side, I'll get in trouble yet. Five years I've gone pretty good. I've mentioned it before, but I haven't made a big deal of it. <clears throat> My class people are constantly telling me all we hear Sunday after Sunday are sermons from the four Gospels. One gentleman even went so far, he didn't quite believe me when I repeated that one day. He made a log. Every Sunday morning sermon for four months. And the other day he gave it to me. Only once did they depart from the four Gospels and they went to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And anybody can preach a sermon out of that. But other than that, it was all from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Not once did they get into these parts of doctrine. And that it's not alone. And it was funny when I shared it with one of the classes, everybody in the class said, well, that must have been my church. No, it wasn't. <laughs> See? Because I know this is routine. And if I've got pastors, and I know I do, pastors, if you're listening to me tonight, for goodness sakes, get to where the meat is. You have to get into these writings of Paul. Because, see, the Gospels, the cross hadn't even been accomplished yet. And why can't people realize that? Christ wasn't preaching death, burial, and resurrection in his earthly ministry. How could he? It hadn't even taken place. Oh, he knew it was coming. You know, I've shown you Luke 18 so often, where he told the disciples, we go up to Jerusalem, and everything written by the prophets shall be accomplished. He'll be spitted upon. He will be beaten. He's going to be put to death. And on the third day, he's going to rise again from the dead. He told them. But what does the next verse say? They understood none of these things because it was hid from them. Well, that gets back to what I said a moment ago. So here, after all these things have been kept hidden for ever so long, now, after Christ has finished the work of the cross, he's ascended back to glory, He sent the Holy Spirit, now he reveals to this other apostle, the one everybody likes to push back in the corner. They don't want to fool with Paul. But it's to that apostle that all these great truths of salvation are now revealed. And that's why he says then in verse 21 here, but now, as a result of the ascended Lord revealing to him that the finished work of the cross did something for the human race, it did the things that man can't do. All right, read at it again. Verse 21, that the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, put in the spotlight, how? By the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. Absolutely. When I stress Paul, I'm never going to say ignore the Gospels. I'm never going to say ignore the Old Testament. We take the whole book from cover to cover. But you have to begin with some basics. Oh, a verse just comes to mind. I'm, I'm jumping, aren't I? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if these things aren't true, then Paul is going to have the hottest corner in the lake of fire. That's right. If what he writes is not true, then he's the biggest liar that ever walked. Then he's the biggest imposter that ever wrote. But he's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. For, he says, we are laborers together with God. You, as he speaks to believers, are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I, Paul says, have laid the foundation. Now, if he didn't, then he's a liar. And if he's a liar, then his writings have no business in this book. But they are, because he's not. The Holy Spirit inspired the man to write just exactly what he wrote. And he says, I am the master builder. Now, when does the master builder come into the scene? Halfway up? from the ground up. 
Paul doesn't come in as a master builder and start continuing with something that has already been building for years and years. Paul comes in and he starts with a brand new foundation. And what is that foundation? Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried, and risen again. You see the difference? That's where he starts his building. And that's what he says in the next verse. For other foundation, see? For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, you see, we're being confronted today, politically and every other which way, of a consortium of the religions of the world coming together. They used to call it ecumenicalism. You don't hear that much anymore. I guess it's still part of it. But nevertheless, I had a young man call me the other day from, I think it was from Iowa. And his pastor had made the statement the previous Sunday morning that after all, all the religions of the world that are monotheistic, in other words, they worship the one God, all of those put together are all in Christ. They're all believers. They're all going to heaven. And he called to say, now he says, I don't know much, but he had seen some of our tapes from a friend. And he said, I know this much, that's not right. Well, I guess that's not right. Because you see, all these other religions of the world know nothing of Jesus Christ as their foundation. And here's where we have to be adamant. Yeah, that's narrow. I'll grant you it's narrow. This is a narrow book. And then when people come to me and they say, well, now, wait a minute, the Koran and the book of this and the book of that, are they all wrong? Well, I'll just come back with another question. Can you name me one other book besides this one that predicted things thousands of years in advance and they happened? Do you know of another religious book of whatever kind that can even tell a prophecy five years in advance? let alone 500 or 1,000 or more. It's the only one, see? And that's why we don't have to take a back seat when we defend this book. Prophecy has secured its accuracy. If you can see that what was foretold concerning Christ's first coming and it all happened, 360 some, I think, individual prophecies, all fulfilled completely, and then you say that the rest of it may not be true? Oh, there's something wrong with your thinking. But it is true. All right, and so come back again to what Paul has just said. I'm the master builder. I've laid the foundation. Jesus Christ is the one and only foundation for what we believe. All right, now let's get back to Romans 3 or we won't make any headway at all. I'll probably be in Romans for the next five years. <laughs> now verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. Now you see, man's righteousness is never brought in here. Not a thing of man's good works is even mentioned. We're talking only about the righteousness of God. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith or faith in Jesus Christ. Now watch how it is appropriated. Unto all and upon all them that, what's the next word? Believe. So here's another one of those places I always tell people, now look and, and analyze how many different things would the world's religions have to put in there. But it doesn't. It's not in there. It says, all of this has happened to them who believe. Plus nothing. Oh, that riles people up. I know it does. But I can't help it. I'm not about to say this verse says to them that believe and repent and are baptized, join a church, or whatever else you want to put in there. It doesn't say it. And we have no right to put it in there. Because, see, this is a whole new concept now on this side of the cross. That because Christ died, 
shed his blood and was able to scream in his final words from that horrible cross, it is what? Finished. And what's the human race trying to do? Add to it. Oh, he didn't quite finish it. I've got to do this. That's not what the book says. The book says it's finished. It's complete. God has done everything that needs to be done to take care of old Adam, to give us a new divine nature, to set our feet on a rock, all the things that you want to put in there. It was all accomplished when he said it's finished. And we can't add anything to it. And so here it is. It's all done unto them that believe. Now when I say believe, I'm not talking about a simple acknowledgement. Well, yeah, I guess that's the way it was. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a genuine heart condition. When that old Adam has been erupted by the law that has condemned him and convicted him, and then we cry out for mercy. I shouldn't say that, and I'm going to take that back. We don't cry out for mercy. We cry out and realize that all of God's mercy has already been poured out. And we merely appropriate it. We say, Lord, I believe it. I can't understand it. I can't comprehend how the Creator Himself came down and took on human flesh and lived those 33 years on the dusty, dirty roads of Israel went the most horrible death ever dreamed up by mankind and did it willingly and obediently simply because he loved the human race and did all that needed to be done in order to just pour it out if they'll just believe it. Believe it. Believe it. And when we believe it, Oh, then God gives us the power again to live it. How many people have told me over the years, well, I'll get saved when I can live it. Well, you can't live it until you're saved. Just like I've shown up here on the board. Until we let God get rid of old Adam, we're going to be lawbreakers. It's our nature. But when we get to the place we can say, all right, Lord, Crucify old Adam. We'll be looking at that in the weeks to come. Then we'll get to the place where we can say, Here my Lord. Do what you can. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.